Hi everyone, I'm Lyric, the founder and CEO of Logitree. It's a pleasure to be with you today. All of us would have seen those forwarded videos on WhatsApp with crazy claims, and many times we might have even forwarded such videos without realizing that they are fake. In the hyperconnected world today, Fake news is more than just a nuisance. It can be life-threatening and can change the fates of entire nations. Think about the January 6th riots in the US Capitol and the recent riots in Brazil which took birth in the dark corners of social media platforms and became mainstream movements threatening entire nations. In this episode of the Founder Thesis Podcast, your host Akshay Dutt talks to Lyric Jain, a UK-based entrepreneur who is the founder of Logically, a startup that is fighting fake news the world over. In this fascinating conversation, Lyric talks about the journey of building Logically, which started as a consumer news app but soon pivoted to fighting fake news with a focus on elections. He talks about their unique approach to fighting fake news at scale with a mix of AI and human intelligence. Stay tuned for the conversation and subscribe to the Founder Thesis podcast on any audio streaming platform to learn about how startups are fighting evil while building a sustainable business. I was born to North Indian parents in South India. So we were one of those North Indian families in the middle of Karnataka that didn't know how to speak any kind of that. My dad is a bit an entrepreneur, but of a very different variety than an innovation driven enterprise. But his life story is almost more, more interesting than mine in some ways. His origin was he was the son of a headmaster in this village in, in Haryana. The family were okay off. They were a typical middle class family, but unfortunately were struck down during, I believe, one of the one of the wars and pretty much lost everything that they had. And dad rebuilt himself from scratch and kind of after marrying mom, did a job as a basically a textile worker in a factory for uh, for a few years. Hear stories of him working some ridiculous hours, which I can't even compete with. Multiple weeks at a time without coming to home at the factory. And eventually was promoted to being manager and then eventually was able to raise money to build his own kind of textile plant. And interestingly, I didn't give him credit to be innovation driven. He actually ended up coming to the UK to buy some like old textile mill bits, like factory machines, etc. because a lot of factories in the UK were closing and moved them to India to, I think, Goa first. And that's where his entrepreneurship journey really began and set up a couple of factories, then got into a little bit of real estate, et cetera. And then eventually moved, when my sister moved to the UK, we all moved to the, moved to the UK. So we moved when I was 12, I think 12, 13. So I was in halfway through eight standard. Remember life being pretty easy. Hey, maths and science are same with harder in India. Um, but I, I really struggled with languages. Oh, French and Spanish, I never learned them. I really struggled with them over the first couple of years. Made my way through school. I then came at a crossroads moment where I was quite intrigued by the world of finance, but also by the world of engineering. Pre-university, it was this kind of challenge with, hey, which direction do I go in? And a good piece of advice from multiple people ended up probably pointing me towards the engineering route. I went to, went to Cambridge. Had a great time with some great people, but even then my head was still turned by finance and investment banking in particular. Cambridge, you did like a bachelor's of science with the computer science specialization or something like that. But no, so it was general engineering in Cambridge. It was when I went to MIT, I saw it as my one opportunity to, hey, if I'm ever getting into computer science, it's here. Otherwise, I'm never really getting into it. And that's, I've done some computer science, et cetera, at Cambridge. But again, no, no discredit to Cambridge, but they didn't really teach it very well. Either. But I think Cambridge did give the solid foundation of computer science to be able to pursue that at MIT. And at MIT, I really got into artificial intelligence. How did, like from Cambridge to MIT, like how did that happen? So this was part of a kind of program that Cambridge and MIT had because it was a joint masters and bachelors. Okay, like an exchange. Yeah, because it was joint masters and since you had, depending on your first year results, your kind of supervisor, et cetera, could nominate you to go to MIT out the other way around. People at MIT could be nominated to go to Cambridge. It ended up being a pretty varied MIT experience, but that was fun. But that was really where the origin story of Logically begins. Okay, I can see on your LinkedIn, you started up while you were still studying. So like, how did that happen? It's unfortunately like a series of really strange events, a bit of family tragedy in 2014, 2015. My grandma, she was 86 at the time, but she still used WhatsApp. 
and she got this tirade of messages saying, hey, drink the special green juice, give up your cancer meds, and you'll live longer. And unfortunately, we lost her a lot earlier than we ought to have. But at that time, no, or very few people really thought of misinformation or disinformation as a problem. And the, those concepts were pretty poorly defined at that stage. I just thought it was fraud, but really started to develop an interest in a lot of social media information dynamics in 2016 particularly in the run-up to the European referendum. So my experience there was quite novel because a home for me in the UK is a little town called Stone in the middle of nowhere. And it happens to be the highest Brexit voting constituency in all of the UK. And where I was at the time, Cambridge, happens to be the highest Remain voting constituency uh, in all, all of the UK. So it was this perfect storm of being having one leg in both poles almost. And I vividly remember one of these moments where a friend from Stone came over to Cambridge and I compared feeds with a friend from Cambridge and completely different information, rife with misinformation. And obviously they made very different decisions, but really it was the misinformation aspect of how much of that was creeping into their feeds and how much almost social engineering was creeping into their feeds. That was quite interesting for me because at that time, like very few had made this kind of observations, but that is still, it was like, Hey, big problem. It's like world hunger. Someone will solve it. I don't know if it's for me to pursue, but it was really when I was at MIT where kind of that problem met potential solutions during my time at C-Cell and the Media Lab there to see how AI is evolving, particularly around content understanding. I think NLP, et cetera, had started to be reasonably well evolved at that point. And really this area of NLU, natural language understanding, had started to become quite interesting. There were some promising breakthroughs that year and the year before. So I really wanted to start applying some of those to this problem context. What is the C-Cell? C-Cell. That's the AI lab at MIT. So there's the MIT Media Lab. And there's the, the C-Cell, which is the AI lab. And I've had one foot in both of those camps doing like a lot of research for basically my coursework pretty much. And that, that's where I took a focus, particularly in kind of content assessment and content risk assessment, et cetera. So these labs are like fundamental research. They're doing fundamental research. They would be like, I think, global leaders in, in fundamental research. What are these labs like for people who don't know? Absolutely. Like C-Cell is kind of one of the top labs for AI research out there, along with probably Stanford and Probably these days, Toronto is doing some ridiculously good work. Yeah, those two, three labs probably are right up there when it comes to global state-of-the-art AI research. These days, there's a bunch of kind of private sector or semi-private sector and non-profit labs that have entered into their foray as well, open AI and various private sector companies. But in terms of pure academia, let's say, yeah, C-Cell and Stanford are way up there. That gave me the opportunity both to interface with our researchers, but also to really focus some time and energies on this problem around misinformation and disinformation. And it was still, these were still early days. It was still late 2016, early 2017. And for me, the technical proof point to reach was, could we quickly hack something together that identified uh, misinformation on a social media platform? Facebook, it was Facebook. How do we really quickly build something that can identify misinformation on Facebook? And that would be the test of whatever we built in terms of, is it good enough? Is it doing a better job than whatever uh, the existing platforms and their, their measures are doing? And yeah, it took us a while, but we were able to build that within a few months. And that really was the milestone for us saying, hey, there's really a there there here that very few other people in the world are going after, but it's clearly going to be a substantial challenge moving forward, given how democracies are being moved because of stuff like this, but also these individual high-risk events, such as what my grandma experienced happening because of events such as this. That, that's when the logically journey really began. It was a solo founder journey, tried spending some time looking to find a few people to build logically together with me, but couldn't really find anyone with have kind of complementary set of skills, et cetera. But yeah, ended up getting solo and really building building a team, an early team when I returned back to the UK. And during the early days, our focus was actually let's build on this technology and get the efficacy of our method methodology uh, up that it works more robustly. But at the same time, let's position it to other products. And during the early days, our focus was very much consumer. It was, hey, if we're able to build a better news experience that pretty much every one of these either social network companies or news aggregated companies that are out there, we probably are going to get a lot of traction. And after a couple of attempts uh, with gradually improving execution, we managed to find a degree of product market fit, particularly when it came to a big crisis event. So be it like elections or even the early days of COVID, when we launched the app, it had like hundreds of thousands of daily active users during those days and weeks, but then retention was horrible. So you were a solo founder. You had together that MVP of 
like a tool which screens for misinformation and tags it. What was that MVP which you initially built? And obviously later on, you told me to try to bring it into a consumer product for news, like a, like a Google News kind of a product, I'm guessing. But what was the original MVP you built? Oh, the original MVP was effectively, give me a social post, be it a long form article or a, like a single claim on social media. Can we check it? And can we check whether this contains any degree of misinformation risk. And it was effectively just a script. It was something that we just had an API for. That was the original kind of technical proof point that was pre-company just as a technical milestone of saying, yeah, this is theoretically scientifically possible. We've got to improve it in a, in a million different ways, but yeah, the concept is viable. How did it give it a score? Like essentially it would give it a score of how authentic this post or article is, how would it give this book? Yeah. So the early days were fairly primitive. So the early day, I'm glad that pretty much everything that I built back in the day, everything, every single thing has been thrown out. So that's good. But some of the primitive methodology has been built on, but at that time it was, Hey, let's just look at the source and let's just look at the content in terms of source. Let's have an index of how credible different organizations, et cetera, all. So like a New York Times or a Washington Post as the source would get a higher score versus some unknown. Yeah. And now those methods have become quite, quite a little more complex going into like domain expertise, funding sources of organizations, et cetera, et cetera. But at that time it's fairly primitive. And then the way we'd look at misinformation risk within the content would be just comparing articles, et cetera, to each other. So it's almost a popularity voting mechanism of, hey, a lot of credible things are saying the same thing, then it's probably true. A lot of non-credible things saying a lot of the same things and not a lot of the credible ones. So it's probably false. So it was pretty naive methodology in terms of the percentage robustness of it and accuracy of it. It ended up being pretty good. That alone is sufficient to get in the 90s when it comes to the efficacy of misinformation detection. But really moving the needle from something that works kind of 85 to 90% time to 90 to 99% time has been the challenge of the last few years. So gaining that next 10% in performance has been the challenge that's taking us another 180 people. How did you feed it data? Because what you're telling me sounds like it must consume a lot of news and posts and articles to really be accurate. So how are you feeding it data? Yeah. So this is also one of the things we've maybe lost so out on by being a, by, by being an early mover. We had to build a lot of our own scrapers, et cetera, because at that time, the, these days it's pretty easy to scrape stuff and there's a hundred different scraping service providers, et cetera. That back then there were some frameworks that were available like Scrapey and Beautiful Soup, et cetera. But so we ended up cobbling those together to build our own scrapers for pretty much multiple different news websites. We ended up licensing some content as well. And that was a lot of our database with long form content. And at that time we had the Twitter API that we licensed from Twitter to get some of that social context. And that was about it. That was all the data that we needed. But when we moved it to MVP land, we knew that data was and data scarcity was going to be the biggest challenge in this space. Even before really doubling down and investing in our engineering teams, we started building out our content assessment teams because fundamentally that's been the capacity that's been lacking globally in this space. There's a bunch of batching organizations, there's a bunch of credibility assessment organization, and they're doing some really important, powerful work that three, four years ago, capacity was pretty, pretty constrained. So we ended up building in-house capacity for that, bringing in kind of a dozen people, which is quite a lot for an early stage startup to focus purely on being that knowledge base for us, for being, for building a methodology for how do we assess the credibility of websites and building a, a methodology for. So you were talking about that in-house team of a dozen people. So these dozen people are like the ones who decide this is an authoritative source of news. This is not an authoritative. Is that what they were doing? Yes, partly. So it was even within them, it wasn't up to one person. We had this almost internal jury system where people needed to come with different views and then an assessment would be made collaboratively within, within that team. And there would be things like inter stage agreement, et cetera, that we take into account before coming up with the, with the logically score. Equally at that time, a lot of sentiment analysis capabilities in the field were pretty, pretty basic. So uh, figuring out how we model stance and entity sentiment, et cetera, was also something that team helped us build out. And also just our, our libraries of misinformation and disinformation. And really that's what kind of gives us a lot of the robustness that we have today, because that's the data that we've been building for like three, four years now. And that team, that team scaled, we have some external partners that help us. We have our platform partnerships that help contribute to that data pool now, but fundamentally this is a data scarcity challenge. One of the challenges of misinformation detection is proportionately how little misinformation actually exists relative to all information on the internet. It's in single digit percentages. It's not like 50%, which makes it a, a tricky classification problem or a tricky, tricky detection problem, which means we need to have good representative coverage of the different 
styles and modalities within this information and say, that's what the team really started mapping out. And I wouldn't say we've mapped out every single type. We today cover the geopolitical context pretty well, and we cover some health really well. But when it comes to, say, financial misinformation, disinformation, that's pretty much untouched by, by, by logic pieces. So long ways to go, but yeah, but that, that's kind of the roadmap for a lot of the efforts that those teams are still making. How did you fund this? You started this when you were still, like you're not graduated yet and you hired people and when you make that happen. Yeah, that, that was thankfully a lot to do with family support. It was a leap of faith for the first few years. We were able to run a pretty bootstraps operation for the first year or so before we got our first, first round of seed funding in from a UK-based uh, VC. But at that first year, getting up to the point of initial traction, that was yeah, thanks to a lot of family support, but also a huge leap of faith that our kind of initial team took on us. And a lot of those folks are still with us today. There are, there are day oneers, and I always admire anyone again, across our journey, who's taken that leap of faith because at pretty much every year we've de-risked our journey that uh, individuals who've joined us four years ago, three years ago, two years ago, set, did certainly take on a lot of risk while joining us. We're a lot scrappier than, than we are today. So yeah, thanks to their investment and as well as family, we were able to build something in form of that consumer application initially that got a little bit of traction that warranted a seed investment. But more than the consumer app, really what the investment was in was the underlying concept and the underlying detection methodology, because that was really what our core IP was. Okay. What was the consumer app called? How did you position it? Oh, so it's called Logically, very magically named. So it was supposed to be this destination, be this one-stop shop for news consumption where people would have automated feeds, which had these big stories. Each story would be a collection of multiple articles that were on the same underlying events or uh, issue that, that occurred. I would present multiple, like an objective summary and a, a number of bullet points of, hey, here's what's happened. The objective summary and multiple viewpoints from across the political spectrum that would be reflected, a timeline of events, and all of this was automatically generated and contextualized through, through our platform. And in V1 post MVP, we also augmented that then with a semi-automated fact-checking service. So automated fact-checking and image verification, as well as some of our, which was supported by our AI as a first pass. And if consumers didn't get, a, get an answer through the, through the automation, they were able to ask our, our teams for an answer, our fact-checking teams. But that was an amazing experience, particularly during election events. And really the first test case for us was the Indian elections. So during, I think, the 2019 Lake Sabha elections, we launched the app, got a, a pretty good amount of traction. But as soon as May subsided, we just saw the retention numbers just completely die. And we thought that was a lot to do with our execution. And we knew we had UX UI issues. So we reinvested in that, that side of what we were what doing. And in time for the Maharashtra elections, we relaunched the app that year. But a funny old thing happened then. So we actually partnered that, that in that election cycle with the election commission and the local law enforcement to identify misinformation during the election. But really, it was supposed to be something that was branding and marketing for us and our consumer app. But that relationship and that engagement ended up becoming commercial. And that was the first bit of revenue that we got. And that's where life became a bit interesting for us because we always knew there is a value proposition of logically in our technology working directly with social platforms and working with various public sector agencies. But we hadn't seriously explored it just yet. We were pretty laser focused until that point on the consumer app story. But on the consumer app side of the business, we still were in this place where we saw that retention dynamic again. And we were like, okay, great. We need to, uh, there's next year, there's the US elections coming up, but we need to have a hedge strategy. We need to go in almost a big final roll of the dice for our consumer proposition in terms of this current formation and conceptualization of it. We reworked a lot of things with the app, launched it out of the American elections. We had an interesting feature for live fact-checking the presidential debates, which got, I think, 150,000 viewers, which is pretty big, given that like big news channels got like single digit millions. Us to get out of that was pretty, pretty big for us. We got featured a bunch of places, but at the same time, building on top of our Maharashtra experience, we started working with battleground states in America in a commercial capacity to really build a software platform POC, like a SaaS POC for how organizations could detect misinformation that could threaten election integrity and other risks more generally. So that October, we, we rolled that out with a couple of partners. And that's really been traction story of Logically for the last couple of years. I want to go back to when you raised the seed round through the consumer app. What was your pitch then? Was it advertising? The monetization pitch? No, it was a subscription. It was subscription. And at that time, we were running a few subscription experiments that were, they were going slightly better in the UK than they were in India. Like the conversion rates in India were pretty poor, like less than a percent. But subscription would 
just give them access to uh, content which is not behind a paywall. It's not like subscription would also give them paywalled content. That was not part of the offering. It was like content with the uh, fact checking. That was the pitch to a consumer. Somewhat. So it was free content. So there was a couple of tiers that were involved. So there was content and freely accessible content that's contextualized in that story concept that I shared earlier with on-demand fact checking. And then some premium content as well. So we'd struck up some partnerships with some of the premium publishers that are out there, URFTs, WSJs, et cetera. And their content was going to be part of the lovely experience as well. So we were a bit further along in terms of commercial aspects, but really the big challenge there for us was retention. Um, for a long time, we put that down to our execution and not the underlying market dynamics, but it feels like for that kind of value proposition, there is a serious and urgent demand for it during crisis events, because even though we don't support, like actively support the consumer app right now, it's still live. And in different markets, when there's surge events, we see like little peaks and troughs in the, in, in the utility of the app, but there's little ways in which we can commercially monetize that directly. But long term, we still want a way in which we can uh, be in the hands of end users and deliver impacts. I think there's still a role for logically and consumers to work together to deliver impact, but it's just probably not at the top of our priority list because we're focusing on these high leverage markets of where we can certainly amplify our impact by working directly with platforms and governments. And that, that, that's the priority for us. The Maharashtra pilot, uh, where they paid you for fact-checking and flagging fake news, what was the Maharashtra Election Commission getting? Was it getting a website where people could see this is fake news or what was it like? What's the product that... No, no. So this was... So because this was supposed to mainly be a, a marketing initiative for us at this point, uh, we didn't think of it commercially. It was this physical war room that we set up in their office. So they had like logically branding everywhere and we'd taken out space physically in their office with loads of press and all that good stuff. But the main value prop there was identifying model code of conduct violations. So specifically things like, hey, your election has been moved from this location to this location. So really not political stuff, but just like stuff every single person can agree on that it's wrong, fraudulent and shouldn't be happening. That, that's the kind of stuff that we, we focused on with them. And it's their responsibility to, during that model code of conduct period to identify these kind of things. And the remarkable thing for us was in the Lok Sabha cycle, all of the ECI across India had found 900 violations. We in Maharashtra alone, I think the number we got to was 20,000. So in one state, we found 20 times more than what kind of the status quo found across the whole nation just three months earlier. So I think that really spoke to a lot of the scale of the challenge that exists in India. And this again, away from like political misinformation and disinformation, which I agree, it, it needs to be handled sensitively. This is just like stuff everyone can agree on is wrong stuff. Hey, your ballot's been moved. Hey, don't come to the election because the election's kept like super obvious stuff that no well-intentioned person can say isn't misinformation or disinformation. Those are the kinds of things we focused on. We also focused on foreign interference and started seeing some degree of fraud activity from uh, the PRC in Pakistan that were as involved during that campaign, even during Maharashtra, which was quite interesting to us. And that got us into some interesting conversations with various stakeholders in India. But that's really began a logically intelligent story, as it were. This was like you were monitoring Facebook and Twitter feeds. Facebook and Twitter posts was what you were monitoring and flagging. That's right. So this was like the way we delivered this was nothing. It was little to do with our consumer app. It was a lot of the backend APIs, et cetera, that we had. We just used to run them on these batches of content and feeds that either the ECI had access to or we had access to and put them, download them as a CSV, put them together in a document and give it to them. And that was it. And they would, we would triage it, maybe prioritize it a little bit. And that, that's about it. So it was pretty like low fidelity in some ways. It was very hacked together because this wasn't supposed to be a product for us, but we really learned from that. And 12 months later, when it came to the American battleground states, we had a, a POC for an entire work site for how the equivalent of the ECI in the US could define their information environment, define what they would consider a threat. Within that, come up with prioritization framework, we'd, we'd fine-tune our models for very high precision and recall. And we then had a remediation process built in as well. So customers could identify and respond to misinformation and disinformation through our platform. And that was the first big moment of fit for us. And in March last year, we ended up launching that commercially available product. But it's not been smooth sailing still, because even though conceptually there's a degree of product market fit, we 
there's still very few people in the world who understand how to deal with misinformation and disinformation. And that's where a lot of the team that we've been building over the last three or four years, that was initially this team of assessors and fact checkers and later open source intelligence analysts, they, they ended up effectively using our platform to deliver various reporting products to, to, to various customers, because currently what we do is a blend of our customers using our platform directly, as well as our, us providing our partners with capacity as well as our platform. So it's almost that Palantir-esque business model of platform only or platform plus uh, delivery. And yeah, it, that, that's uh, the scaling story over, over the last 15 months. So for the US election, when you had the product ready, I just want to understand that product a little better. So this product would monitor social media activity about elections. Maybe there would be some tags or prominent accounts and stuff, which you would identify these are related to the election. And it would then create a repository of inauthentic or like posts which have a low score. And then what you said there was... A like a mechanism where consumers could see the posts and like a redressal mechanism? I didn't understand. So not consumers, but the departments of state or whoever are responsible for acting on those risks. They can make multiple decisions. Again, you can monitor this monitors cross platform, both articles as well as short form posts. We didn't have a lot of multimedia back then. So it was only text only and English only. We assessed what had a degree of misinformation risk. So that was or disinformation risk. So either because of content or because bots were involved, or because a nation state actor was involved, or because it looks like someone's impersonating an election official, or someone's calling for violence against an election official. So those, the, again, those aren't all of them, but those were uh, emblematic of the kinds of risks that we were identifying on the, on the platform. And each one of those uh, risks, be it an individual account, or a piece of content, or a piece of activity, that could be investigated further through the platform. So we would contextualize it, again, probably not in October, but the more recent versions of the platform, we contextualize it with who is it reaching, how many people is it reaching, and which locations is it reaching people, what demographics people are, is it reaching, is it hyper-targeting people, or is it pretty pretty general, et cetera. And then it gives users options if, hey, what do you want to do about this? Do you want to typically do nothing? Because sometimes that is the best option. Don't give them more oxygen. Sometimes it's, hey, this isn't just harmful activity. This is a legal activity, and we need to related to law enforcement or another agency. In other cases, hey, this is clearly a platform terms and service violation. Let's flag it to a platform and see if they agree. And finally, it's coming up with some kind of fact checking or communications in response to a piece of misinformation. Those are examples of some of the remediations that were baked into the platform. The reporting was baked in, quoting that tweet or that post and saying that this is fake news. All of this was baked in, like it could all be done through logically product. Yeah. And okay, so I, I understood this part of it. Now tell me that what the, the next part, which you told me as a platform or a platform plus service, J just help me understand that a bit. Sure. So really it steps from the challenge of there not being enough capacity still in the counter misdis space, because a lot of the organizations that need to tackle misinformation, disinformation, they don't have specific analysts or dedicated resources to go out and assess and use platforms such as logically to identify misinformation or disinformation, because end of the day is the platform. There needs to be a user at the end of this platform to really deliver some amount of value. And most organizations don't have that. So you're saying that this, this act of reporting versus posting that this is fake news versus escalating to law enforcement, this act is something which you also provide as a service because often... That's right. But it's not just that act. It's setting up the information environment. So... Right now with a Euro, I don't know, your your election commission coming up in India and there's some elections coming up later. The CIA will be elections in two years' time. You're you need to figure out what's your monitoring scope, what's your information environment. You're clearly not gonna monitor at like ten billion pieces of content every day because everything on the internet is relevant to you. That's unfeasible for some organizations, that's unfeasible for most organizations. So you're probably not gonna do that. So with your scope, how do you define what is election and election adjacent? What's MCC violation and MCC violation adjacent? And the platform can help someone do that, but it needs a degree of subject matter expertise and a, and a user who's trained to do that. Then you need some kind of framework for what do you prioritize? Because the number of threats here will be in the thousands or even the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands. So what's your prioritization framework? What does you as an organization care most about based on your policies? Logically can't really decide that. We can advise, yes, but do you care more about, again, it's as explicit as this, do you care more about, and is this a bigger concern for you if an election worker getting killed by a conspiracy theorist or a million people believing that the election was hacked? Which one is a bigger risk to you and which one do you care more about? And making those high policy decisions, again, it won't be as blunt as that, but 
effectively what's your prioritization framework and that's for a customer to build logically can advise our, our services team can obviously consult and then it's about okay what does proportionate and effective response look like a lot of kind of unexperienced people in the space will be like, hey, it's misinformation, it's disinformation, let's just take it all down. No, you'll make the problem a lot worse by just doing that. So proportionate and effective response would be looking at it and then making a calculated decision based on what the potential impact would be of taking something down or reporting something to a platform or escalating it or actively doing nothing, putting out a piece of fact check. Yeah, again, we're baking all of those things into the platform as part of the roadmap to make it easier for future users. But for today, that's a degree of specialism and expertise that users need to have, users need to be trained and certified to be able to use that platform. And some organizations have that. Some organizations, even including in India, have those super expert users, but a lot of organizations don't. And that's where kind of our accredited teams can step in as well, be it our fact checking teams or our open source intelligence teams and provide that capacity should that be needed. What do you mean by open source intelligence teams? It's, it sounds like a really fancy term, but one of the ways in which we can think about it, they're just expert Googlers in some ways and expert researchers in the online landscape. I do them a disservice by calling them that. It's a, lot, a bit more complex than that, but effectively the discipline within intelligence gathering and within intelligence analysis. So you might've heard of signals intelligence or human intelligence or the James Fondy stuff is human intelligence or some part of it is that an open source intelligence is really anything that's in the open source domain and the publicly available, publicly accessible domain. How do you build an intelligent and a common operating picture uh, as a result of what exists in the open source domain? How do you detect threats as a result of what exists in the open source domain? That's really that open source intelligence discipline. The uh, engagement with a uh, body like a government body, like an election commission starts first with scoping. So scoping means what? Does it mean that they give you that these are the keywords or they give you the geo tags or like the location that I want to monitor this location. I want to, do they give you the accounts of those people who are standing for election so that those accounts can be monitored? What all comes in scoping? All of the above. And it has to do a little bit with who the organization is. So when it comes to say accounts, if you want to monitor accounts, you have to be a very specific type of organization with very specific authorizations, but logically to have a monitor accounts, because that's almost surveillance. That's again, depending on the regulation of a particular country, that's pretty much on the surveillance side of things. And if you have the authorization, we'll obviously do it and the platform will do it. But usually it's defined on the basis of content or on the basis of location or on the basis of what audiences it's potentially reaching. So relevance in a given location or for a given community or things such as that. So it's a combination of all of those factors that go into it. Like we have a love-hate relationship when it comes to things like keywords. They're a very blunt instrument. You can, you can think of it as, hey, someone, put, someone wants to look for the word bomb because they're looking for, I don't know, threats of car bombs. But if someone thinks that the word like, hey, this car is the bomb or oh, that song was the bomb, you're, you're, it's, it's going to be pretty, pretty poor. So that, that's the whole point of a lot of the intelligence systems that we have supporting our ingestion as well as our threat detection systems is to just filter out a lot of those false positives. It's scoping and figuring out what the information environment looks like on the basis of contents, accounts, activity, on the basis of locations, as well as demography. And so this is one part of your business, which is, let's say, the B2G business, which is where you're selling to government organizations. What about platforms? Do you also sell something to platforms directly? Does Facebook or Twitter, do they use your product or service? Yeah, it's, I think it's publicly known. We work with Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. So we work with them partly through our friend Holden's platform and partly through our fact-checking. Again, the modality there is pretty similar. The only exception in the platform cases, sometimes they want us to provide the information, like very much how we do in the government context. But a lot of the time, they already have feeds. They have feeds because their users have flagged various things on the platform it's, as being potential misinformation. And that enters into our queues, either into our automated queues or into our teams. And it then goes through the assessment stage again, either through our services team or through our platform, comes up with an assessment. That assessment then goes to the platform and the platform's then responsible for doing whatever on the basis of that assessment. They have their own policies. So Facebook policy is slightly different to TikTok's policy, which is slightly different to Twitter's policy, which is slightly different to Google's policy. So based on these assessments, they apply they, and enforce their policies. So essentially when someone hits the report, this post for inappropriate content, that post will come to you for the like, Only if it's misinformation. Oh, okay. When someone is reporting, they are asked to give a reason there, like there's a drop down or something. First. That's right. So if it's hate or if it's child safety related, et cetera, that's not our 
spread about it. Many other organizations in the world do powerful work for that. For us, really the domain where we specialize is misinformation and disinformation and associated harms, things that occur as a result of that underlying misinformation and disinformation. That That's our core specialism. Okay. Okay. So when someone is tagging it for misinformation, like report inappropriate and the reason is misinformation, then that post comes to you for like giving back Facebook a decision on it that yes, this is there or to what degree is it misinformation? So you will give Facebook back some information on which they will take a further action. And your decision making can either be purely machine driven or at times the machine may not be able to give a clear decision so it will go to the human. That's right. Again, these are all the little nuances for each platform. The third platforms have like triggers of, hey, a thousand re users need to report it before we send it to someone. Some platforms like it's more to do with the concentration of users. If 10 users have reported it in 10 seconds, then we'll share it. Again, we're not involved in a lot of the policy decisions and the reasons for why it enters into our feeds, but platforms decide that based on their policies, it enters into our feeds and we're responsible for the assessment. We're responsible for the robustness and expediency of those assessments. And platforms are then responsible for, again, what they want to do on the basis of that assessment. How do you decide when you will give a machine generated assessment and when a human will look at it? Confidence. So every assessment that we have is kind of confidence based, but our automated assessments, as well as our people assessments, wherever kind of confidence levels are below a certain level that's commercially agreed with, that's when we'll refer it to our team. In some cases, for some platforms, everything has to go through a manual review, regardless of the automated review. Someone will have to check whatever has been assessed by a veracity stack. And probably like something critical, say election might, this might be the criteria for those kind of posts. Yeah. Anything that might be high sensitivity or high impact, probably good to use to go through manual review. Anything that I just, in the assessment itself, we're uncertain because I, either for an absence of information or too much contradictory information or evidence, we would have a lower confidence level or anything with data that's not very timely, like claim might be one day old, but our most recent evidence context of it, maybe one week old. So all of these are, again, I'm, I'm peeling the onion a little bit too much here, but those are the kinds of signals that are given to confidence. And I guess with time, the human moderation, which is happening today, would be training the machine learning algorithms to be able to increase the confidence level and reduce the percentage of content, which goes to human moderators. That's right. Within a domain, yes. So we've certainly seen that in the geopolitical domain or when it's come to issues around COVID and you can very clearly see that S curve of improving performance and plateauing performance based on how much training we're getting from expert input. But really, there's so many domains, there's so many different domains for us to go into. So we still need to scale those subject matter expert teams for the foreseeable future. But yes, eventually there will be a, an automation payback and there'll be kind of, again, that S curve of how many people we're going to need to, to support the overall level of outputs we're able to deliver. Give me some scope of numbers. What are the number of posts that logically is assessing daily, weekly, monthly, whatever, like some idea of well, what are the metrics that you look at? Every day, it's every day we pull through about 15 million pieces of content, I think. 15 million. Yeah. But that's not enough as we need to hundred X that because there's over a billion pieces of content that are posted every day. It's closer to 10 billion every day. I think Twitter alone, I believe is just under a billion a day. Uh, there's a long way for us to go in terms of scaling. This is very much as a tip of the iceberg. A lot of the un underwaters and undercurrents of misinformation and disinformation. This is where it's exposed to enterprises, brands, and even individuals. And that's a follow on market for us to start working with some organizations. What are the other metrics you track? What are the numbers you look at on a regular basis? One would be how many pieces of content you're reviewing? What else? A few. There's, for us, it's the efficacy of our automation. That's a pretty, pretty big one for us to continuously see trending up as a result of investments in our roadmap. We have this interesting framework. It's our capability completeness framework. And it's almost this big jigsaw puzzle that we want to build out what our roadmap looks like and what is that? Where is that from a completeness level and where is it from a performance level? Both of those are things that we measure and track quite closely. There's obviously the financial sides in terms of... How do you measure efficacy? So I see you're saying like would mean how good a job you're doing at flagging or giving a score, like how accurate your score is. How do you measure it? Like how would you know that this... Is it based on what whether a human moderator is disagreeing with the machine score? Is that how you say? That's right. Both, even within our expert operations, and we don't just put things through one person, things have to go through three people 
before we come up with assessments, et cetera. So we have FP scores in both places. What's our interannotator agreement or what's our uh, inter-assessor agreement when it comes to people? And what is it between the overall people outcome and overall machine learning outcome? These are all scores that yeah are pretty closely tracked by our teams. And you said you also track revenue. I want to understand what is the way in which you monetize? Is it on per post or I'm sure the model will be different for a platform versus for a government agency. Like what is the commercial arrangement like? Sure. It really varies that the, we have this interesting construct. We call it the situation room. And we bring this back to our Maharashtra days because Maharashtra was a war room that we set up. So it's effectively a, a product concept that we have called situation room, which defines this information environment that someone needs to monitor, detect stuff, detect threats and triage them and respond to them. And so it's a price based on the size and complexity of the information environment. So the size would be obviously the number of posts, the number of accounts and the number of interactions. And the complexity would be things like how many languages is it? Is it just text or is it multimodal? So stuff like that would be, be something that goes into what the overall kind of subscription value for a customer would be. And then it's effectively recurring business models, very much a recurrent revenue business model. Yeah, that, that's the way we're priced. And obviously for most technology driven businesses, it's the ARR number that we tend to keep a pretty close eye on. Those numbers are usually pretty top of mind. Say Maharashtra Election Commission, they would subscribe for it throughout the year or this will just be like that one couple of months period for which they would subscribe? It really varies. For us, it's, we definitely share the story of this being an always on risk. This is a risk that is again heightened during these critical events, but there's a lot that an organization can be doing to mitigate those risks by being ever present, even in less intensive months. So uh, for some of these types of organizations, we do have surge pricing to, to be able to accommodate those high impact windows and a more accommodating pricing level when it comes to business as usual. But yeah, a lot of organizations use us all the time, but it's like 90 or well, 85 to 90% of the work that we do is on a always on basis. Of a 10 to 15 percent of our work is certainly on a very much an event driven basis but again that that's work that we do to demonstrate the value of what we can bring to certain organizations and really if it's an organization that's facing one kind of risk it's pretty likely that they're going to have a new crisis pretty soon in the government space beyond the election use case are there other use cases also like other types of government organizations that you work with absolutely for us there's four core use cases within the public sector there's public health public safety, election integrity, and national security. So those four are key use cases. Within public health, it'd be public health organizations, hospital networks, again, some countries have sync. Like COVID misinformation and... Yeah, or even in, in general, there's a lot of anti-vaccine misinformation out there. In India in particular, there's so many online frauds that are driven like from kidney transplants and all of that that are driven through misinformative and propaganda driven scams. There's a lot of other, particularly in the space of alternative health. It's a, uh, it's a touchy space given the Indian cultural context, but it's certainly some clear cut areas where the, there are some disinformation campaigns there. In the public safety space, that's very much to do with communal violence, as well as potentially nation state activity. So a lot of time nation state actors step into stoke some of these internal fires. There's obviously elections and national security would always be around both foreign interference, protecting a country's interests domestically, but also protecting a country's interests overseas. That one's quite interesting because when Lotkri started, 18 countries or I think 16 countries had information operations capability that allowed them to run some kinds of information operations, either within their own borders or outside their countries. Today, that number is 90. So that's 90, pretty much, so basically half the countries in the world can run information operations right now. So it's a pretty polluted landscape that, yeah, that again, is a pretty, pretty critical use case for us. And this would be like in India, like Ministry of Home Affairs for this kind of, like they, they would be your clients or like Ministry of Health and Welfare for health related stuff. And... Yeah, across again, both at central level, at state level, it'll be those kind of organizations, but beyond kind of ministries, it's each of them, these have affiliated agencies. So it's, we, our work is mainly with kind of the, the, the various branches of the civil service, as opposed to with kind of political executives, et cetera. So it's really working with those organizations, health, home affairs around that there'll be focused on law enforcement. There'll be some focus on national security in some agencies. There'll be some focus around the upcoming interesting landscape is also the regulatory dimension. A lot of countries are looking to regulate platforms and regulate how a lot of these 
trust and safety operations are run. So in the UK, we have this online harms bill that's coming to parliament pretty soon. India has had, I think, one attempt already at regulating this last year as the amendment to the rules governing the IT acts, but there's also, I think, some other redrafting for it that that's it's currently ongoing. So there's that, if it feels as an emergent catalyst for us as a space, because what's become clear is that platforms, although they are trying and they're trying hard, some harder than others, but they're certainly trying to tackle this problem. They've proven that they can't do it alone. There's obvious risks, governments doing this by themselves around freedom of expression and kind of the, all the politics around it, but also so it, it, I think this is something again, regardless of me wearing my logically hat from an independent perspective, it's still hold the view that it needs to be something that's run by an independent organization or a free market of independent organizations. That's really a place we want to get to. So you would typically work with like a consulting agency that would further have the government as its client. That's what you say. The government is the airplane. Some point, yes. Okay, sometimes. Okay. It's a mix of both. So. Yeah, sometimes it'll be through various, uh, we call them channel partners. So it'll be through channel partners. Sometimes in some cases it'll be directly. In India, we've done both. In the UK, we've usually gone direct. In the US, we've done both. How did you navigate this sales to government? So you need typically white-haired folks driving something like that. How did you navigate that? Like big sales to government? I have no idea. Yeah. I'll let you know when I figure it out. In startup world, it definitely gets a bad rep. Also in venture world, it's always seen as a bit of an ugly market in some ways because there's horror stories of how long sales cycles can be. But for me, the biggest reward in the government sector kind of thinking commercially is Again, huge amount of impact because of just the big leverage that governments and platforms have, but stickiness. Once you're in, you're pretty much in, and unless we grew up in some horrible way, it's an incredibly sticky customer. And I think that that's, that for us is the biggest value of over-investing during those early days to go and acquire these customers. But yeah, I think that's what we've been biased towards. And we do have a couple of more, more gray-haired individuals in, in the team than myself. They, they obviously help. And what do you charge the platforms? Is it on a per content, per post that you review, something like that? It varies. It's close enough to per post. It's the some kind of compliance around that in terms of, hey, can't be a duplicate post, can't be a highly similar post, et cetera, et cetera. But those are priced slightly differently. But yeah, broadly, it's on a per post basis. What is your ERR right now? Are you at liberty to share that? Not quite publicly. 10 million plus? Just south, just south. So we raised a $25 million Series A a couple months ago. What kind of, you have the ability to fact check text, video, audio, everything? Or what is the current capability in terms of the modes? Yeah, we're in a really interesting place. So I think by the time this podcast is out, we will have released the fully multimodal version of the platform. At the moment, in the current architecture, it's very much te text is the bread and butter. And there's some image bits that are bolted on and some video bits that are bolted on. But the version of our platform that's being released on the, in the first week of August, it will be multimodal by default to so not just a text only, image only, audio only, video only. But when, when they're blended up together as well, it'll be like memes will be covered or like an image with a, with some text within a WhatsApp message, like the, the, all those form factors will be covered. Quite excited about that update in three months time. How did you solve that? I'm just thinking of the kind of WhatsApp stuff we get where there is somebody, let's say, talking in a regional language and who's giving some misinformation. Are you able to detect regional languages also and all of that? Or that sounds really, really challenging too. Do it for video. In a limited way, some. I think we can be, we do a pretty good job in 12 Indian languages. But beyond those, it's a big challenge in addition to kind of those Indian languages we work in. Some European languages as well that really want to ex expand our roadmap to be able to cover all major languages, or at least we want to have kind of, I think, a list of 110 languages that we want to cover before the end of the year. I think it, we're always going to be in this place where our level of efficacy and performance in English will naturally be higher just because the state of natural language understanding is a lot more advanced in English than it is in any other language. I think Mandarin's pretty close, but we can't work with a PRC. Although we can, we can monitor them if someone's interested, but we certainly can't work with them. You're using like an existing voice recognition engine. Say Google has this voice to text engine and all, or you're building your own engine. It's a little bit of both. So it depends if it's formal speech or informal speech. So if it's formal speech, like a lot of the things that, that are available on the shelf are just way better. So we use those, but when it's to do with informal speech and kind of 
social media speak in particular. We haven't found, again, with respect, whatever exists, market be it Azure or AWS or Google has that high level of efficacy. So we're fine tuning what we're building internally for the social context and using what's available commercially for formal speech. Fascinating. Okay, you told me you're doing some corporate pilots. So what would that be? Say McDonald's would want to make sure that there's no fake news going on about it. Like from that perspective? Yeah. So I think there's two or three main verticals for us within this. Kind of there's the security side, which is this approach of conspiracy driven threats. So it's literally, there's, particularly in the States, there's organizations right now whose kind of, I don't know, officers, warehouses, and executives are being targeted because they're believed to be part of some big global conspiracy or that's... Like the pizza gate thing, there was some pizza partner. Yeah, or like vaccine sensors and fat manufacturers of vaccines and stuff like that. But it's really broadening out. Like last year, it was Wayfair. Was it last year or was it the year before? It was Wayfair. It was a furniture company that became the epicenter of the QAnon conspiracy because they had cupboards that had the names, that had women's names. And these conspiracy, they, and they were quite expensive. They were like $5,000, $10,000 cupboard. And these conspiracists thought, hey, they're trafficking women that are called that in these cupboards. That's the, like, come on. Like, uh, this was a serious conspiracy. And this organization was being targeted. Some people got radicalized to the point where they wanted to start getting after executives. They started finding out who these executives are, who their children are, and like really like nasty stuff, unfortunately. So these kind of threats today are present. So that's a lot of the security dimension. The, there's also a financial dimension here. I think there's some pretty interesting examples in India of a handful of banks in particular that have been targeted by various amplification pump and dump schemes. Remember the, there was a rumor about ICICI bank is shutting down and there were lights outside of ICICI ATMs of people trying to withdraw their money. Yeah. That's right. So again, those kinds of events, it's both from a financial disinformation, the market manipulation. You can think of crypto even as a segment. We have something quite interesting we're working on at the moment for the crypto whole things that there's so many inauthentic accounts that are pushing various coins and there's clear trading activity that's linked to that post, et cetera, as well. That, that's an interesting problem for us. And so is kind of pure reputational side even. And that, that one's slightly more challenging for us because I think there's plenty of organizations that are out there that do a good job at reputation management. We don't necessarily want to go into that. But for us, if there is a, an active disinformation threat that's focused on an organization, that would be interesting. And in some countries that market exists and others it doesn't. Because historically, when people have thought of disinformation campaigns, they've thought of countries. What's happened over the last three or four years is there's now these agents of disinformation available for hire in various countries around the world. It's very much equivalent to almost ransomware. Ransomware was this kind of big cyber threat that's happening today. People knew about it probably for the last five, six years, but our positioning is similar where ransomware was maybe in 2016. The threat vector exists, but it's not ever present. It's like one or two organizations are being targeted by it every few weeks and months, but it's not hundreds every day, but it's, it'll be there in, in three years or four years from now, given what, what's happening in the adversarial space. And you're located like in India also? Where's your headcount? What's your headcount split like? Yeah, so we're about 170, 180 people at the moment. And about half of those are based in the UK. Just under half based in India. About half a dozen based in the US. So around 80, 70, 10 or 90, 80, 10. Yeah, and what is the team in India doing? Are these the tech guys or? So tech as well as split across the UK and India. They're mainly our, most of our engineering teams sit out of Bangalore. Most of our AI teams sit out of London. And most of our product teams also sit out of the UK. And we also have some of our subject matter expert teams when it comes to batch checking and open source intelligence that sit out of India as well. But the majority of, of people in India are within engineering roles. Right, okay. You raised this pretty massive $24 million round. What do you want to use these funds for? It's pretty much half and half. It's, we know there's a long way for us to go in terms of furthering our, our platform itself. I think the multimodality aspect that I mentioned being one of the, one of the milestones where we're gearing up to, but equally, yeah, we have a pretty, pretty aggressive roadmap to, to better support some of our high leverage customers in particular, as well as differentiate our product offering potentially for enterprise. It's then also investing in new threat vectors. Again, there's a lot of buzz around deep fakes, but it turns out it's not probably the biggest disinformation threat. There's a few other interesting things happening in the world of synthetic text in particular that are probably a bigger threat vector. where we're keeping on top of and red teaming all of the new emergent disinformation vectors and uh, the other half is really going into building our uh, our code and market teams across these three countries okay w what are the new vectors of misinformation w what is synthetic text like i mean people have heard of deep fakes in the video form and there's a lot of kind of buzz around them but 
in terms of how much you see them in the wild, it's mainly just porn. Like 99% of deep fakes out there are porn, which again, it's a risk that exists, but it's not purely, it's not missed. Missed is, it's very small percent. Like maybe every couple of weeks, you might get one that's high profile in nature. Synthetic text is really the text equivalent of that. So it's imagine you can create a disinformation campaign that's posting a thousand very different posts from a thousand different accounts. There's some, there's been a lot of progress in that direction by a lot of organizations that are working in the adversarial space, but also things that are building on top of recent big breakthroughs in natural language generation. So that's a pretty significant risk at the moment. I think we've seen one of the campaigns that were actually been targeted to targeted Wikipedia. I think there was one attempt that was recently made to edit, I think something like 10,000 Wikipedia pages concurrently. Again, these edit wars are always going on. But what was interesting about the most recent one is the editors were all like all 10,000 edits were being made by a, a synthetic agent. And you yeah, bot, bot based edit wars are also common, but what the new dimension was, they aren't just spam posting the same thing. What they're writing is human-like and in some cases easy to detect, but in some cases pretty challenging to detect. We, we see that as an interesting dimension. The other dimension we also see is really this two truths, the kind of social engineering framework. So it's getting people down a rabbit hole of radicalization. So giving them two truths first and then giving them the third lie has been a repeated tactic we've seen from various adversaries. So I think tactically, a lot of knowledge sharing might be happening within the adversarial space right now, and they're converging towards some best practices. Yeah, they're developing their playbooks. So we need to just stay ahead of them.